Are you currently studying for the A-plus certification exam, Core 1 objectives? Join me for a discussion on some of the more popular topics right now. Hi, Wes Bryan with ACI Learning, and in today's episode, what we're going to look at is the A-plus Core 1 objectives, and we're going to dive into some of the more popular concepts that sometimes give students or exam candidates a little bit of difficulty. Let's go ahead and take a look at the objectives. You can see that when it comes to the Core 1 objectives, they are broken up into five domains, and you can see the domains here at my right. Now, I will say what you need to focus on is the fact that the networking domain, hardware domain, and the hardware and network troubleshooting domain, they really form the bulk of the overall exam weight that you're going to be facing when you sit in the exam booth. What we're going to focus on more specifically is 2.0 networking, and we're going to look at some how the networking domain breaks down. 2.0 networking domain breaks down into eight different objectives and concepts that you need to be aware of. And we're going to go ahead and what we're going to do is we're going to divide, uh, we're going to dive into, I should say, domain 2.1, and that's compare and contrast TCP and UDP ports, protocols, and their purposes. Now, the reason that we are diving into domain 2.0 networking specifically is because I have found in the past that when it comes to some of the sheer memorization Students, exam candidates, the learners, if you will, they can struggle with this concept. So let's dive in and let's talk a little bit about some of the TCP and UDP ports that you need to be aware of to pass that very first A-plus Core 1 exam. We're going to start out with some file protocols, and I've kind of grouped these uh, together based on their purpose and functionality, and we need to be aware of what the protocol name is. If you have already started your studying for the A-plus exam, the very first exam, one of the things you're going to notice right away is we really aren't shy of alphabet soup. There's a lot of acronyms, but it is important to understand that you're learning a new language. So like learning any new language, it can be tough when you first start out. So let's discuss a little bit about the file protocols that we can see inside of this exam. The very first file protocol that we really need to look at is one that has been around for a very long time. In fact, this goes back to the earliest days, uh, really, of the ARPANET. It's an oldie but goodie, been around for a very long time, and that's called FTP, or the File Transfer Protocol. And it is highly optimized for network file transfer, if you will. Now, keep in mind that there are a couple of uh, ports that you have to be aware of. You'll see that there are port 20. Uh, that's our command. So when I type out and I'm interacting with a uh, FTP server, and I'm sending commands, whether it be to push something up to the server, pull something, get something, if you will, from the server, the commands are going to go over port 20. Uh, however, when the data actually transfers, the data transfers over port 21. And that's one of those ones that can be confusing because of the fact that you look at a protocol and you say, okay, well, I know that most protocols have a single port associated with them. Not so on this one. So definitely be aware of that. And don't let that confuse you when you sit on the, uh, you sit the exam and you're faced with a scenario. The next one is, I want you to think of it as like FTP Lite. That's really the uh, what it is. With uh, FTP, that goes over TCP ports, so it's a connection-oriented, reliable service. However, uh, the Trivial File Transfer Protocol, TFTP, this is a stripped-down version of uh, FTP, and it goes over the User Datagram Protocol, or UDP. It's connectionless, and we use it a lot to deliver things like configuration files, and that goes over port 69. I definitely want you to be a bit aware of what the acronym means, what the purpose of the protocol is, and that port associated with it. Then the next one that we have to look at is adding a little bit of security to FTP. See, FTP, when it started out, there were really only five entities that were connected to the ARPANET back in the early days, so security wasn't really that much of a big deal. Well, boy, have times changed, and in the modern world, we definitely have to make sure that if we're transferring information over a network, that we are securing that communication, and that's where SFTP comes in. And that is really nothing more than a secure shell, SSH, if you will, and we'll talk about that coming up as a remote protocol that you need to be aware of. And then what happens is we establish that secure shell over port 22, and then we send those FTP commands across it. 
So I just want you to make a mental note that the fact that the secure FTP shares a port with SSH, which you'll see a little bit later. Then finally, we have to talk about one that's inside of the Windows world, and this is something known as SMB, Server Message Block. Now, there is an open standard of this, and it's called the Common Internet File System, CIFS, but I don't really want you to worry too much about that. But if you hear that, just know that that's the open standard versus Microsoft proprietary implementation, which it started out with. That's SMB, Server Message Block, and it's how we share resources is how we connect to printers, if you will, over a Windows-based network, and that's going to be port 445. So those are some of the file protocols, and remember what some of the purposes associated with them, because it's going to be important on the exam if they give you a scenario that you can identify these, again, given whatever that scenario might be. Now, I mentioned briefly and kind of teased you with a remote connection protocol. Well, that's where I've kind of lumped the next series of protocols together. And the remote connection protocols, what they allow us to do is connect over the network when we're not in the same physical location of the computer that we're trying to connect to. And it allows us to remotely connect and control those computers. The very first one I want to uh, go ahead and uh, talk about is uh, we'll take another trip in our uh, DeLorean, you know, back in time here, Telnet. Telnet was one of the very first protocols like FTP that allowed you to connect with a mainframe computer over a network via a dumb terminal and you could interact with whatever the mainframe was. Telnet is an unencrypted, unsecure protocol, and that's important to understand that if somebody can get, gather that or capture that information off of the wire, off of the network, they can really see exactly what you're doing. So Telnet, again, terminal emulation, or Telnet, if you will, telecommunication networking, I think is what it's short for, goes over port 23. Now, today, what we want to use is we want to make sure in the modern world that we're securing the communication, especially when we talk about connecting to a remote uh, computer or networking device. And the way we do that today is with Secure Shell, uh, also known as SSH. All right, SSH goes over port 22. And what happens is we create this communication channel where the information is encrypted in between it. So now let's take the same scenario and somebody captures that information off of the wire or off of the network. What they're gonna see is a bunch of scrambled data. I want to go ahead and remind you that when we talk about secure file transfer protocol, Really, the only difference is what we're doing here is we're starting the secure shell to the file server, and then we're using FTP through that uh, encrypted tunnel. So that's another one that I want you to be aware of. Now, because this is uh, this um, uh, test is going to have a lot of uh, Microsoft or Windows-based technologies, it's also important to be aware of a remote connection protocol that's very popular in the Windows world. And that's something known as the rem Remote Desktop Protocol. It's associated with the remote desktop connection software that comes by default inside of your Windows-based operating systems. Now this is port 3389, and it's, a, it's the way we make a secure connection to a Windows machine when we're not in the same physical location, and what it gives us the ability to do is take control over the desktop. Now, I wanna give you a little exam alert here that can help you out, because there's another protocol that's very, very close to port 3389 and might trick you if you're not prepared for it on the exam. And that's another protocol called LDAP, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. When we connect with a directory service server, if you will, and we need to communicate with it, we do that over port 389. I only mention it here because port 389 and port 3389 are a lot alike. Just remember the remote desktop pro protocol or RDP uses port 3389. And again, used inside of the Windows environment. Now the next thing, probably one of the most popular communication technologies that we have in the industry today is gonna to be email protocols. If we don't understand email and how to support it, well, pretty much most of your business communications are gonna stop. So it's very important, not only from an exam standpoint, but also in the real world that you understand the next set bulk of protocols. And we've kind of put them all together here. Uh, we have what is known as the simple mail transfer protocol, if you will, SN, uh, SMTP. And that is for outbound email and that's over port 25. It is important for the exam. Remember the direction of the communication because that's gonna help you out. Remember, purpose is important, not just being able to identify the protocol and the port, but what they're used for as well. Now there's another older, uh, oldie but goodie, if you will, and this is the opposite direction. This is actually for pulling information down, uh, email, if you will, down from an email server or 
inbound email. And that's something known as POP3, just generically. It's the Post Office Protocol version 3, and that is port 110. Now, another common one that we use today, if you've ever used anything like an online email service like Gmail, maybe Yahoo Mail uh, and uh, Outlook.com, if you will, then you've probably used this one and maybe you didn't even, you weren't even aware of it. And that is the Internet Message Access Protocol IMAP, if you will. And that goes over port 143. Now, a little bit of an exam uh, alert on this one. Also want you to be aware that it uh, is very, very close to another protocol that we're going to see that allows us secure HTTP communications. That's HTTPS. That is port 443. Do not confuse it on the exam because it's one of those ones. It's very, very close and it's very easy in a stressed environment. You know, you're under pressure on the exam to maybe get that wrong. So remember, IMAP for inbound retrieving email over port 143. Now, like we've said in the past, there came a time and a necessity to secure these communications. And inherently, when they first came out, they didn't have any security associated with them. So we also have secure email protocols that we need you to be aware of which means that they're the secure variants of the ones we just seen. So for instance, if we talk about keeping that information secure so nobody can read the information, the first one is the secure simple mail transfer protocol, and that's over port 587. Keep in mind, that's outbound email over something known as transport layer security. It's a way to keep that email uh, communication secure. Then we also have the secure post office protocol version uh, three, if you will, or secure pop three. Uh, and that is inbound, remember the direction, retrieving email over TLS or transport layer security, and that's going to be port 995. Well, last but certainly not least, we've mentioned IMAP in a previous slide. Let's go ahead and mention the secure version of IMAP, and that's IMAP secure. That's going to be port 993. And again, that's retrieving email over transport layer security. The big purpose in these is to make sure that your email communications are secure. And if anybody captures that information off of the wire or off of the network, they're not going to be able to read the contents of that uh, communication. Now, another big uh, uh, set of protocols, if you will, that are inside of really everything that we do today is web communication, right? And that's where our website protocols come to mind too. And there's two that I want you to be aware of for the exam. This is how we communicate with web servers. It allows your web client, the web browser, to communicate with a web server and actually pull the hypertext markup language, the HTML, down to the browser and it, re it renders the web page in the browser. Well, we do this in an insecure manner through something known as HTTP. That's the hypertext transfer protocol. HTTP goes over port 80. Keep in mind that this is also an unsecure, unencrypted communication. So if I'm visiting a web server over HTTP and somebody grabs that information, unfortunately, they're going to be able to tell what is in the communication. That gave rise to a couple of other variations of it. Today, we see it as HTTPS, all right? But I do want you to know that underlying, under the hood, if you will, there are two different versions. There's a legacy version, one that we really don't use anymore, and then there's one that we use today. Both called HTTPS and both use port 443. That is encrypted web communications, and the older one was using SSL, secure socket layer. Today we use transport layer security. That's just a little bit of a under the hood. Remember, it is the same protocol, if you will, using the same port for your exam purposes. So this is how we lock down that communication and we make sure that it's secure. There are also, well, some network services that you have to be aware of because remember, network protocols, when we talk about protocols, they, ad they identify the traffic and the type of communication. So some of the network service protocols that we have to be aware of, one that's been around for a very long time is the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, DHCP. It does have two ports, kind of like FTP does. Uh, one is for the client side. So when my computer calls out to the network and says, hey, who's got an IP address out there? That's going to be communicated over port 67. When the server, the DHCP server responds and says, hey, I've got an IP address for you and communicates back to the client, that's going to be port 68. Keep in mind, this is how we can assign dynamically IP addresses and other various host configuration options. 
probably one of the most important protocols that we use today to allow us to find websites and various things across the internet today is something known as the domain name system or DNS. It allows us to take a name like ACI Learning and map it to an IP address so that we can use user-friendly names out there on the internet, something like www.acilearning.com, that's all I had to type in. And then in the background, the domain name system finds the IP address associated with that website and maps it to it and we can connect. DNS uses port 53 for name resolution. Now, time is very important over the network because we got a lot of things that we do and we have to make sure that we have synchronous communication sometimes. And that's where our next protocol comes in. That's something known as NTP or the network time protocol. Now, Easy way to remember this for the exam, it is the one, two, threes, if you will, of network time, right? That's one of the ways that I try to remember it and it helped me on the exam. Remember it's uh, port 123. This is for time synchronization. It allows us to communicate with various other components and make sure that the clocks are synchronized. Last but not least, we use a computer, uh, a um, technology called Simple Network Management Protocol. You might've heard it as SNMP. Now, what this allows us to do is this allows us to find the various state of our network devices, our firewalls, our routers, our switches, our servers. And what it allows us to do is install agents, a piece of software, if you will, on those connectivity devices. And then what they'll do is they'll communicate with a management station over port 163. And the agent, if you will, will communicate back with the various devices as the manager or management station over 162. All right, it allows you to collect information about the state and many different things of the various devices that you have within your networks. Now, we do have a few more network services that we have to be aware of, and I mentioned this one already. This is what's known as LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, and when you have a directory server and you need to communicate with the database and the directory service, you're gonna do that over port 389. Keep in mind, do not confuse that with port 3389, which is Remote Desktop Protocol or RDP. Then we also have the secure version, if you will, of L uh, LDAP. LDAP secure, and that's going to be port uh, 636. Now, another type of way to keep uh, track, if you will, and collect logging information on the variety of devices that you have on your networks is an oldie but goodie going back to the earliest days of the Unix-based systems and continuing into Unix and Linux today. That's something known as syslog. And syslog allows you to collect logging messages so that you can scrutinize them and find out information about your devices over port 514. Last but not least, we have what's known as the Session Initiation Protocol. This is called SIP. I want you to understand that what this is about really is your voice over IP, your VoIP phones, right? Uh, that's where you commonly see it, but it's for things like real-time video, if you will, messaging and signaling. And there's an encrypted and unencrypted version. Remember that those concepts still apply. Unencrypted means it's plain text, clear text, if you will, and anybody that's out there on the network and they grab that information, they can see what's going on. So we have unencrypted SIP communications over port 5060, and we have encrypted or secure communications over port 5061. Now, these are some of the ports that I know can give our viewers, if you will, our members, students, exam candidates, some problems. So get out your flashcards, write down some notes, memorize these, and when you're sitting that A plus core one exam, you're gonna be in a very good spot. If you like what you've seen here today and would like additional videos on a training and a variety of other IT training, like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.